We can all agree that Harry Potter did some pretty amazing things during his time at Hogwarts. He won the Triwizard Tournament as the youngest contestant by far, defeated Voldemort a bunch of times, and broke into and escaped from the impenetrable Gringotts. But I think we can also agree that he had a lot of help along the way. I mean, one of the most powerful students at the school just so happened to be one of his two best friends. I shudder to think where he might have been without their aid. You all know who I'm talking about. Let's say their name together. Ronald Weasley. Uh, oh, was that not who you had in mind? Oh, you were thinking of Hermione Granger? I mean, she was smart and everything, but Ron could literally see the future. Don't believe me? Let me explain. Now, before I get too far into this, I just have to say that if after seeing all the evidence laid out in front of you, you still don't believe that Ron Weasley has the inner eye, you're not alone. Ron himself seems to have no idea, and that's what makes this so interesting. He's constantly cracking jokes and telling stories and putting himself down, but if you peel back the layers, you'll find that a lot of those jokes and a lot of those stories turn out to be correct even ones that are way out there. And that Ron is at his best when he's confident and just following his gut. But I'm getting ahead of myself. If I really want to prove that Ron is the next big whiz of divination, there's only one logical place to start in divination. The Golden Trio are constantly treating that class like a joke. But let's take a look at how Ron performs when he's actually making an effort. In his very first class, when Ron is reading tea leaves in order to predict Harry's future, he says this. There's a blob, a bit like a bowler hat. Maybe you're going to work in the Ministry of Magic. But this way, it looks more like an acorn. What's that? Ah, a windfall. Unexpected gold. I think we all agree he sounds pretty ridiculous here. I mean, he can't even figure out what it looks like. Except he's completely right. After Harry beats Voldy for the last time, he goes on to work at the Ministry of Magic as an Auror. And as for that unexpected gold, the very next year, Harry unexpectedly wins a small fortune in the Triwizard Tournament. Coincidence? I think not! Okay, one lucky guess. Except, it happens again, the very next time he makes a genuine attempt. He predicts this of Harry. You're going to suffer, but be happy about it. Well, that one has to be wrong. It's impossible to be suffering and happy at the exact same moment, right? Wrong. Look at the end of that year, when Harry is almost kissed to death by the Dementors. There's no doubt about it, Harry is very clearly suffering in that moment. Except, there is a second Harry there, at the same time. While one Harry is suffering, the other is smiling. He's excited as he thinks he's about to see his father. In that moment, Harry is both suffering and happy about it. And yet again, in Goblet of Fire, they're doing their divination homework when Ron advises Harry saying, why don't you get stabbed in the back by someone you thought was a friend? At this point, I feel like I need to give a spoiler warning whenever Ron speaks, as this is the big reveal of the whole book. Mad-Eye Mooney, who seemed to be Harry's newest friend and ally, turns out to be a raging lunatic, trying very hard to have him killed. I don't know what grade Ron got on that homework assignment, but it was not high enough. But hold on, that's not necessarily Ron's fault. That just is divination. Maybe there's just something to the topic that Trelawney's teaching them. The thing is, Ron's spoilers are not limited to divination class. In their very first year, while they're waiting to be sorted into their houses, Ron mentions being worried that they'd have to wrestle a troll to be sorted. He's relieved to be wrong and gets sorted into Gryffindor, the house of the brave. Just a few months later, however, he does find himself battling with a troll. And in doing so, he commits his first major act of bravery, living up to the Gryffindor name. Maybe he didn't have to fight a troll to become a Gryffindor. But he did fight a troll to prove himself one. Cool. Then in Chamber of Secrets, his gift of inner sight takes a ghostly turn. He is forced as a punishment to polish an award that one Tom Riddle got for services to the school. And he gets to wondering, what could Tom Riddle have done to earn this award? 
He says, maybe Tom Riddle got 30 owls, or saved a teacher from the giant squid, or maybe he murdered Myrtle. That would have done everyone a favor. Finally, a prediction that's just plain wrong. There's only 12 possible owls, and there's never been mention of the giant squid getting the better of a teacher. But wait a minute, what was that third point? Maybe he murdered Myrtle? Well, Tom Riddle actually got the award off of a lie after he framed Hagrid and Aragog for the murder of Myrtle. A murder he actually committed himself with a basilisk. So, yes, Ron, you're completely right. Tom Riddle got that award for murdering Myrtle. And if that's not crazy enough, it actually gets even better. By the time of Deathly Hollows, our three heroes are perfectly comfortable saying Voldemort's name. They say it constantly while they're on the run. Until Ron gets a funny feeling that they shouldn't anymore. While making yet another daring escape, they accidentally reveal number 12 Grimmauld Place to a Death Eater, thereby removing it as a safe place from Voldemort's crew. Shortly thereafter, they're discussing what to do next. Hermione is just about to say Voldemort's name when Ron stops her. Don't say the name, Ron cut across her, his voice harsh. Harry and Hermione look at each other. I'm sorry, Ron said, moaning a little as he raised himself to look at them. But it feels like a jinx or something. Can't we call them you-know-who, please? But why, Ron? They'd been saying his name for so long. You'd been saying it. Why stop now? But they do stop, at least for a while. And when they eventually do slip up and accidentally say the name once more, they quickly learn Ron was right. Voldemort, knowing that they no longer have the safety of Sirius's house to fall back on, puts a spell on his name to locate anyone who says it. Turns out Ron was a much bigger help in the forest than they even realized. Now that's all well and good, but if Ron could actually see past the veil, why doesn't he ever use it? Actually, he does. When do we see Ron really thriving? Well, the first instance that comes to my mind is in Wizard's Chess. To say Ron is good is like saying Harry's scar is a paper cut. Ron is not good. Ron is a prodigy. Professor McGonagall is known to be majorly into Wizard's Chess. So much so that when asked to protect a one-of-a-kind and very dangerous artifact, her idea is to set up a giant chessboard and to program it to literally crush all opponents. Except Ron, at the age of 11, not only beat the game, he did so while practically ignoring three of his best pieces to protect himself and his friends. I think it's distinctly possible he had a little unconscious help in predicting the giant board's moves. Even more than that is how he is when he's playing Quidditch. Ron is at his best when he's not thinking. He falls off his broom and he accidentally punts the quaffle across the pitch. He just happened to be at the right spot, swinging his leg in just the right way to make the save. But even more than the convenient accidents are when he's extremely on his game. In Order of the Phoenix, Ron manages to bring home the house cup because he loosens up and just starts listening to his gut. Out of nowhere, I thought, you can do this. I had about a second to decide which way to fly, you know, because he looked like he was aiming for the right goal hoop. My right, obviously. His left. But I had a funny feeling that he was fainting, and so I took the chance and flew left. A funny feeling, eh, Ron? The thing is, that game, despite all those crazy saves, is still only Ron's second best Quidditch game. In Half-Blood Prince, Harry tricks Ron into thinking he's taken liquid luck. As such, Ron loosens up again and plays the game without thinking, just doing. The thing is, it's very difficult to be a keeper. You constantly have to pick which hoop to try and cover whenever a chaser is coming in to take a shot. Even Oliver Wood, who goes on to play professional Quidditch, would let in at least a few goals each game. But that game, with Ron letting fate decide his actions, managed to block every single goal. And that's with him taking breaks from even paying attention to the game to conduct the crowd and singing, Weasley is our king. 
In the end, the evidence is just too much to ignore. Harry Potter got as far as he did by making the right friends. Both the cleverest witch of her age and a best friend who can see the future. Even if he doesn't always realize it himself. I hope you enjoyed this theory. Just a quick note before you go. As of this recording, the Uncanny Jamin are just 71 subscribers away from the first tier of monetization. And we're way past the watch hours requirement. So if you want to be a part of helping us across the finish line, go ahead and subscribe. If you're still on the fence, maybe watch another video. Maybe that one will convince you. In chapter 37 of Order of the Phoenix, Dumbledore says to Harry, I have watched you closer than you could possibly imagine. Well, I think I figured out what he means here. So if you want to hear my theory on that, click the video on the right. Either way, thank you for watching.